This video is on depth first search. It's the fourth video of a playlist on basic graph algorithms following an introduction to graphs, how they are represented, and breadth first search. I will assume that you already understand those and will compare and contrast this to breadth first search as I go. We will see the idea, a simple and then more detailed implementation that adds timestamps and more, searching the whole graph instead of just one vertex, and a full example on a directed graph. I'll finish with one pitfall and how to avoid it. Depth first search can run on directed or undirected graphs and it ignores any weights. We assume an underlying adjacency list representation. If you're looking at a graph from above, breadth first search is pretty intuitive. It expands from your search vertex like a wave in a pond. But lots of times you aren't looking at a graph from above, you're looking at it from within. You're exploring a maze or an area in a video game. Or maybe you're watching a video on YouTube. We can model that video page as a vertex. And if there are a bunch of video recommendations listed over there, those links are like edges to other vertices. If you see three that look interesting, maybe you click on one. Not now, wait until the freaking video is done. I'll do it. Oh, what is that? Okay, from this second video, maybe you see four more recommended videos that you think look good. Do you click one of them, or do you stop, remember that they're there, but then go back to the second of the three videos on the first page that looked good? You just keep clicking through videos until you run out of interesting links or time? That's like depth first search. If you go back and watch videos in the order that you first saw a link to them, that's like breadth first search. Breadth first search is harder to do unless you use tabs or a watch later list, which work as breadth first search's first in, first out queue. For depth first search, you just click on stuff, and when you run out of new stuff that you want to see, you hit the back button on your browser to get back to the previous video. Starting to think about implementation, similar to breadth first search, we start by initializing the graph, marking everything is undiscovered, and then searching some vertex I here. From there, we go to adjacent vertices, E, then H, but even though H has edges to two new vertices, D and F, that we haven't seen before, we just pick one, D. Go from there to B to A, ignoring other vertices we could have visited along the way. We do that by making recursive calls to depth first search for each new vertex. Vertex A's only outgoing edge leads to D, which we've already seen, so we exit A's depth first search call, returning to B. B was looping through its outgoing edges when it made that call to search A, but now that A is done, B's loop resumes and it gets to its edge to G. G has no outgoing edges, so it finishes, then B finishes, and now control goes back to D. Now that D's call to B is finished, D's loop resumes and it searches F. In breadth first search, D and F would both be children of H. Like in breadth first search, if you think about what vertex discovers another, that implies a depth first search tree. Here, I started with vertex i, and I've shown the tree, but just like breadth first search, we can store parent values in a pi variable, and we can reconstruct paths from the root of the tree. But they're less interesting here because they might have more than the minimum number of lengths. So instead of counting links, we actually track when each vertex is discovered and finished with timestamps. We don't need actual timestamps, just a relative order. Why track timestamps? Because I said so. That's why. No, it turns out that depth first search timestamps will be useful for other tasks like topological sorting. Without any more justification, I'll just add those timestamps to the algorithm. Also, for some algorithms, you want to run depth first search from one vertex, while for others, you want to run it on the whole graph. To do that, after initializing the graph once, run depth first search on each previously undiscovered vertex. Then, instead of getting a depth first search tree rooted at one vertex that only includes vertices reachable from that vertex, we get a forest that will always contain all the graph's vertices. Let's walk through an example of that using the same graph, but starting with top level searches on vertices in alphabetical order. Start by initializing the graph with some dummy times and then search A. Discover it, and then for its adjacent vertex D, search it. D's first adjacent vertex is B, so it discovers B. We search that, even though D isn't done yet. 
B has an edge to A, but A is already discovered, so we move to its next edge to G. G has now outgoing edges. We finish it and its recursive call, going back to the parent B, which has no more outgoing edges, so it's done too. Returning to D, it still has an edge to an undiscovered vertex F, which leads to C, which has outgoing edges, but they all lead to vertices that are already discovered. So we finish C, then F, then D, then A, filling in finish times as we go until we get to the end of vertices reachable from A. If we're searching the entire graph, we then see that B, C, and D are already discovered, but E isn't. We start a search on it. That search will only discover one new vertex, H, which only has edges to things that we've already discovered. Next, F, G, and H are all discovered, but I isn't. It doesn't discover anything else, so it makes its own tiny tree. A, E, and I are the three roots of trees in this depth-first search forest. We can actually summarize that entire depth-first search nicely using parentheses. An opening parenthesis stands for when the depth first search call is made on a vertex, and the closed parenthesis is when that call exits. The parentheses are properly nested because the inner recursive calls must complete before the code that called them. A child will always be nested in its parent, and a vertex is only the child of at most one vertex, the one that discovered it. If you just count parentheses from the beginning, they will match the discovery and finish times. In the Corman book, they do two more things. First, they color vertices white for undiscovered vertices, gray for vertices that are discovered but not finished, and black for finished. I used shades of yellow and green, but we can just look at our discovery and finish times for each vertex instead. Undiscovered nodes are white, finished nodes are black. They also classify edges. Besides tree edges, they also classify non-tree edges into three types, back edges, forward edges, and cross edges. Going back in our example, let's see that. A back edge is an edge to a vertex's ancestor, its parent or grandparent and up. From that ancestor, there's a path of tree edges leading to the vertex, and adding the back edge to those tree edges makes a cycle. Without looking at the picture as a whole, how can you tell locally, while you look at that edge, that A is an ancestor of B? A has already been discovered, but it isn't finished yet. A's parentheses is still open, and A can't finish until after the current vertex B does. So A's parentheses must surround B's, and it's B's ancestor. So this is a back edge. I'll put back in black. During depth first search, every back edge completes a cycle, and removing back edges from a graph would remove all cycles. Next, a forward edge goes to an indirect descendant, not a direct child. Here, the edge from D to G is a forward edge. Again, how can we tell while well, just looking at that edge? G is finished, but its discovery time is after the current node D's. G was discovered and explored during the lifetime of G. It's a descendant. I'll put forward edges in blue. One clarification, if you have a self edge, an edge from a vertex to itself, that's a back edge to be consistent. It completes a cycle of one edge and it goes to a vertex that's been discovered but not finished at the time you explore it. Finally, a cross edge is any other edge. You can go from one branch of a tree to another, or even from one tree to another, and there isn't any ancestor or descendant relation between the vertices it links. You can tell because it leads to a vertex that finished before the current vertex was discovered. Its parentheses don't overlap. For undirected graphs, you end up seeing each edge twice, once from each vertex. If we classify the edge the first time we see it, there won't be any forward or cross edges, only tree and back edges. Analysis is pretty simple. If we run depth first search on the entire graph, we loop through all vertices, but only call depth first search once on each vertex in total. We explore every edge once or twice in undirected graphs, and it takes time linear in the graph size. If we run depth first search on just one vertex, it takes time linear in all vertices to initialize, but then time linear in just the reachable portion of the graph to run. 
Unlike breadth-first search, if a graph is more connected, its depth-first search trees tend to be taller and more vine-like. If vertices have lots of outgoing edges, you can keep finding new vertices to explore, and the tree depth can get large. We saw that for this graph, depth for a search on vertex I gave a tree with six levels, and it would have had eight levels if D had explored F before B. That brings us to one implementation hiccup for depth for a search. For each recursive call, you push variables onto your program's call stack. Different languages have different limits to how deep the call stack can be. A graph with 20,000 vertices might try to make 20,000 nested recursive depth first search calls, which can give you a program stack overflow error. To avoid that, you can use your own stack instead of using recursion. You can do that in a few ways. Here, I make a stack where you can push edges and vertices. To start, push all the vertices onto the stack and pop while the stack isn't empty. If you pop an undiscovered vertex, discover it push it again to finish it later, and push its outgoing edges. When you pop it again later, after it's discovered, finish it. And if you pop an already finished vertex, just ignore it. That's the equivalent of looping through all vertices, but only running depth for a search on the undiscovered ones. When you pop an edge from the stack, if it leads to an undiscovered vertex, it's a tree edge. Label it and explore that vertex. Otherwise, just label the edge and you're done with it. In the two lines where you push either all vertices or all edges from a vertex, if you push them in the opposite order that you would normally loop through them in the recursive version of the algorithm, then this version will give you the same results, same times, edge classification, everything. They'll all be the same as the recursive version. This one doesn't look quite as clean, but it's a nice parallel to see that while breadth first search explicitly uses a first in, first out queue of vertices, Depth for search can explicitly use a stack of vertices and edges instead of just implicitly using the program call stack. That's it for depth for search and my graph basics playlist. For an unexpected way to use depth for search, you can look at topological sorting, but right now I have to go depth for search my nasal passages. This nose ain't gonna pick itself.